This is the Functionize Podcast, the most advanced podcast on the airwaves today. We bring you the latest in science of the human body and how to perform at a far higher level and exceed even your expectations. This podcast is brought to you by them at Functionized Integrative Therapeutics, www.functionized, F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N-I-S-E-D. For the latest, greatest, and most efficient manner in order to live as a better version of yourself. From biofeedback, audiovisual entrainment, metabolic nutrition lab testing, chiropractic, and the advanced high tech fit lab, the most efficient, effective, and always proven. Once a week, 15 minutes, no more, total body workout. Everything is quantified, everything is proven. Now, what you've all been waiting for, the Functionize Podcast. Today on the podcast, I'm going to talk to you about understanding fat and nutrition for human performance at the cellular level. See, everybody's still all carb, carb, carb. We love the carb. And it's not necessarily necessary for performance, especially at a cellular level long term. From the beginning of human life that we know it, we have wrestled with the notion of paradigms. And at one point in time, we believed the Earth must have been flat, right? Before this concept was changed, there was violent resistance, and alas, from our current perspective, we have a sphere, which we call Earth. Now, I'm not here to vilify any single person, any group, and... Research on animals is not going to be referenced as the anatomy and physiology. It's different, you got to understand, than humans. So, so much research is done on animals, but it's not a human. And what happens in an animal, a rodent most of the time, is different from that of a human. When I started researching about the idea of fat as fuel. My goal is to discover what foods our bodies actually function optimally from, and most importantly, why. It's important to understand this knowledge for the efficacy of what we're doing. What can we do to fuel the mitochondria of our cells in order to have the most production without burning itself out. That's key. That's key to have the most production from ourselves every single day without crashing and burning. In the 1940s, there is epidemiological research done by Dr. Ansel Keys, and the American Heart Association began to recommend the low-fat diet to eliminate heart disease. This diet was built on the belief that fat, especially saturated fat, caused increased cholesterol levels, and high cholesterol levels caused heart disease and obesity, typically obesity and then heart disease. This belief came as Dr. Ansel Keys observed that when saturated fat was poured into the drain of a kitchen sink, it solidifies and clogs the drain. Makes sense, right? Do it at home, you'll end up calling the plumber, or if you're handy, just unscrew that thing and pour some hot water through and uh, clean that thing out. But nonetheless, Dr. Keyes believed that in the 1950s, or 1940s, I should say, through the 1950s, that this was the way our bodies worked as well. Dr. Keyes believed that 
Fat in a drain was comparable to atherosclerotic plaque in our blood vessels. However, eh -eh, that doesn't really happen this way, as hopefully we know by now. And if you don't, I'm telling you, it doesn't really happen this way. But at the time, this was the belief, and it's the foundation of the standard American diet. The low-fat diets that are replaced by either too much protein or most of the time too much carbohydrates that is causing heart disease. But this is the diet that was given in order to prevent heart disease. Unfortunately, to prove this hypothesis of Dr. Keyes, there is more bias than truth. In the 1980s, based on the very infamous Seven Countries study, the United States Department of Agriculture created the Food Pyramid, which further vilified fat. And since that time, the United States government reported that Americans reduced their consumption of saturated fat by a whopping 11% and reduced total fat by 5%. Americans even followed the government's official advice and lowered consumption of dietary cholesterol such as the type found in eggs and shellfish, even though it's been proven that cholesterol in food has been proven to have very little impact in serum cholesterol levels. Our body wants to maintain homeostasis. So just by consuming cholesterol doesn't mean that our body is just going to absorb all the cholesterol. If you ain't using it, you're losing it. And you actually need this cholesterol in order to create the actual steroids in your body. The male and female hormones, estrogen, testosterone, even the lipid bilayers needs it to repair in every single cell of your body. You start eliminating this and you start to undergo hormone dysfunction whether you realize it or not. And unfortunately it becomes too late when you start to realize it and then have to undergo therapy in order to replenish it when you could have just lived a proper lifestyle in the first place. In 1952, Dr. Keyes began his argument for the low-fat diet and predicted if mankind stopped eating eggs, dairy products, meats, and all visible fats, heart disease would become very rare. And instead of heart disease being rare, at this point in our present time, the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, estimated that 75 million Americans are affected by metabolic syndrome X, which is a disorder characterized by central obesity, high blood pressure, elevated triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, which is the good kind, and high levels of fasting plasma glucose. A combination of these symptoms increases risk for coronary heart disease, stroke, and diabetes mellitus type 2. We also refer to this as cardiometabolic syndrome and insulin resistance syndrome. And since the USDA first recommended a low-fat diet and introduced the food pyramid in 1980, a good year to be born, the obesity epidemic has steadily increased each year. In baby boomers alone, obesity rates have risen for over 20% from 1980 to 2006. And instead of rates of heart disease decreasing, it's instead quintupled, rising from 1.2 million to 5.4 million. So the more and more nutritional studies that are completed, we appear to be getting sicker as opposed to healthier. This low-fat diet that is supposed to be so heart healthy is quintupling. Quintupling, do you understand? 1.2 million to 5.4 million based on this diet. It doesn't work in the way it was supposed to work. So obviously we've got to keep doing the wrong thing over and over again, right? Because it doesn't work, but we're comfortable with it. Time to break out of the barrier, time to break out of the mold, and start doing things that are a little uncomfortable because they're better for us and work. I've heard heart disease is very painful, and it is avoidable. Let's do something different and avoid it together. It's an early death sentence, and a life filled with ailments and disease. And it's a curious dilemma on what's being done to bring back the true health to humans. It's understanding the basics, the true knowledge, the underlying foundation in what we need to do for ourselves that's paramount. It was believed that early man actually traveled in packs or tribes and we roamed the region in which we inhabited to pursue wild game. 
when the region's wild game became depleted, we'd move to a different region. As doing health studies on people's long deceased, unfortunately not possible, what we can do is the <laughs> I love saying this word ten times fast, epidemiological studies on the descendants of the ancient people around the world today, and follow up with control trials. It's actually in Seinfeld, it reminds me, I'd say a hilarious episode, they were all funny. I still watch the reruns from time to time. They're short. It's easy to watch and makes you feel good. It appeared that everyone from the main cast of characters to New York City's Mayor Giuliani was eating a non-fat frozen yogurt. So therefore they believed they could eat as much as they wanted and not gain body fat weight. So in theory it made sense. Eat fat, get fat. And as most people realized though, as everyone else did in the episode, even while eating foods that do not contain fat, they got fatter, they gained weight. It was something other than fat that's causing individuals to get fat. While protein and carbs contain four kilocals per gram, fat contains nine kilocals per gram. So therefore, fat is much more energy dense than are its macronutrient counterparts. And macronutrient, for if you do not know, is carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Simple as that. And for generations, doctors have advised us in order to slim down, we must avoid fat. Ethically speaking, though, it appears that the opposite is true. You're starting to garner this, aren't you? If fat made people fat, then everyone eating the Atkins diet would have had to be rolled out their front door as they'd be freaking ginormous. Be a crap ton of lawsuits, but there's not. Instead, those that live the Atkins way lose countless body fat, retain, and even increase muscle mass. Amazing. It's... Nah, I won't go into the timing of nutrients. I'll, I'll talk about that in a different episode. There's been a lot of confusion lately of eating carbs earlier in the day versus later in the day, thinking you've got more time to burn off the carbs than earlier than later. However, as I just said, with macronutrients, I guess I'm getting into this, aren't I? It's four kilocals per gram on a carb, but nine kilocal per gram on a fat. Therefore, which one do you think is going to take longer to burn? So therefore, which one do you want to eat earlier? And which one actually raises insulin, which causes you to retain fat? Yeah, so I guess I'm going to get into it now. Totally off topic tangent, as I often do here, eat your fats earlier in the day. Have your carbs later in the day. DM me, talk to me about it, because there's so much more I want to talk about here on this particular podcast on cellular health. And we can talk about nutrient portioning at a later date. So going back to what I was talking about here, let's keep things basic. Your bodies can either utilize glucose or ketone bodies for energy. One of the two, pure and simple, at least as we understand now. Unless we can start utilizing corks or uh, Moscovium or something funtacular like that, we're going with glucose or ketones. When glucose is not readily available, our bodies are in constant state of releasing fat to be converted into energy. We utilize gluconeogenesis to do that. We utilize ketones. When we eat a meal high in carbs, insulin levels spike, driving glucose into cells. Glucose not used is then stored as, survey says, body fat. So thus, by constantly introducing carbs into our body, body fat is unable to be released to be used as energy, and we get fat. So we do not get fat by frozen yogurt alone, my friends. The higher the carb ranks on the glycemic index scale, the more insulin is released, and thus the more energy we potentially stores body fat. Now, fat is the only macronutrient that does not stimulate insulin. So think of your body as a machine. You can use a hot, slow-burning fuel that lasts a very long time, or use a short-burning fuel that needs to consistently be replenished. For performance, maintaining a lasting energy makes much more sense than having to continuously consume sugar, spike insulin, lather, rinse, and repeat. Our cells were not designed to operate in this manner. Our bodies deserve much, much better. When given better, they perform better. 
Now, a group of experts in the field of nutrition make a consensus publishing a high-level paper confirming no benefit can be demonstrated for eating carbohydrates rather than saturated fats. This was Astrup. At all. This is rather a bold statement to come forth with during the time when the opposite is held to the gold standard of nutritional belief. That's what I'm saying. you got to do something different. If it's not working, if you're eating a certain way and you're getting fat, you step out of that comfort zone. Do something different, lose the fat, and reduce that risk of the preventable metabolic syndrome X, cardiovascular disease, etc. You're going to let hear so many so-called experts squabble on this topic, and here's me, the expert squabbling on this topic as well. Just listen to me, you'll be okay. Our bodies gain fat by consuming carbohydrates, especially sugar. Get rid of sugar in your diet. Keep it low. I mean, you're going to get sugar from almond butter, almonds, and other nuts. But it's so infinitesimal. Keep it low. There's no need to start reaching for things that sugar is artificially added to, or spoonfuls of sugar. It's not going to do you any good. I promise you this. Everyone's going to argue how our bodies work, but it's basic human cellular physiology. Our bodies work how it wants to work, and there's little you can do to change this. Now, we can alter it in positive ways, but your cells are going to function how they function. There's going to be a sodium-potassium pump. There's going to be a calcium channel that's working in the way it's supposed to work. Your neurons are going to fire in a particular manner. We can either make everything work better or worse. That's how we can influence things. I choose better. I don't know about you. Better every time. You want to be optimal or suboptimal? Choice is yours. Now, in 2010, the LA Times declared fat was once the devil. Now more nutritionists are pointing at sugar and refined grains. And the paradigm has been starting to shift slowly but surely. It's just not fast enough. And it takes a long time for paradigms to shift. First, there's got to be questioning, violent resistance, and eventually there's going to be some change. Now everyone started reaching towards polyunsaturated fats, and I kind of call it a false hope. There is so much propaganda vilifying saturated fats, and it's been telling us to avoid them at all costs. The fats to eat, supposedly, are the healthy fats, which only in moderation now, I say that facetiously, are thought to be polyunsaturated fats. It's going to be prudent, once again, to go back to a little biochem. And I've said this on quite a few occasions here, but if for some reason you're just joining us for the very first time, then here you go. And if you've heard this a bunch of times already, then it is what it is. You're getting a refresher course. Lucky you. So bear with the science for a moment as hopefully this makes sense. So a fatty acid, fat, is a long carbon chain surrounded by hydrogen atoms with a carboxyl acid group at one end. These chains can vary in length, and it's the type of bond between the carbon atoms that dictate whether fatty acid is either saturated or unsaturated. See, saturated fat contains only single bonds linking carbon atoms together with a fatty acid chain. And these molecules cannot bond with any new atoms as they are only already saturated with hydrogen atoms. Now, due to the structure, these fats are only straight chains that pack together tightly. This causes saturated fats such as butter, lard, suey, and tallow to be solid at room temperature. Not about to clog your drain, though. Now, in contrast, a polyunsaturated fat gets its name from multiple. Poly. It's a double bond. And these added bonds are like trying to hug two people together at once. We all love to hug, right? But if hugging only one person can give a warm bear hug, the other individual being hugged is not going anywhere once in this embrace. And by introducing person number two, the hug becomes less stable, and the other hugging arm can be freed up at any moment to take on more people, which are, in this case, carbon atoms. The bonds are then going to kink, and they can be freed up at any moment to take on more people, also known as your carbon atoms. Now, the 
bonds are going to eventually kink. They're going to lose their rigid structure. And it's no longer lying nice and neat against its neighbors. The fatty acid molecules are going to lie loosely arranged forming oils. Examples are canola, rapeseed, safflower, sunflower, peanut, corn, cottonseed, soy. A lot of people think these are healthy. However, get into that in a second. Now, monosaturated fats contain only one single double bond in its carbon chain, making it far more stable than polyunsaturated fats. Examples are palm, olive, and coconut oil. Now, due to the double bond structure of vegetable oils, here's where we go. They oxidize easily. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the type of fatty acid in these oils, linoleic acid, oxidized into 130 volatile compounds such as, in addition to free radicals and aldehydes, sterile derivatives and products from degraded triglycerides plus other unnatural chemical compounds created by hydrolysis, isomerization, and polymerization. I know, it's a lot, but it's something that needs to be said to truly grasp where we're going here. So in 1976, researchers studied the population of Israel who at the time consumed the highest quality and quantity of vegetable oils in the world. Their rate of heart disease was actually quite significant, which directly contradicts the belief of the protective qualities of vegetable oil. If vegetable oil does lower total serum cholesterol levels, this should mean rates of heart disease should be reduced, right? And if this is true, then total serum cholesterol levels should be directly proportional to heart disease, right? And we know this isn't the case. Vegetable oils consist mostly of omega-6 fatty acids, which is pro-inflammatory. And as they go down the prostaglandin-2 pathway, omega-3 fatty acids, which mostly come from fish and grass-fed free-range meat, yes, and grass-fed free-range meat does have higher levels of omega-3, far better than organic farm-raised fish. But you knew that, right? DM me and ask questions. Uh, follow the prostaglandin 1 or 3 pathways. That's the omega 3s. Follows 1 or 3. And as we know, diffuse inflammation is characteristic of internal disorders such as heart disease. And heart disease in America continues to rise. So I ask you to question what is told to you. You can find the answers. Saturated fat is something that people still, for some reason, continue to vilify. And we just went over the fact that it's far more stable in its structure than is an unsaturated fat. And if it's more stable in the structure, it's less likely to oxidize. If less likely to oxidize, it's less likely to cause genetic mutation in heart disease. So what's the problem? If poly unsaturated fats are obviously not what they're thought to be, then what's wrong with the saturated fat, I ask you? Why is it vilified in mainstream media? At the point in our period of time, it's still understood of saturated fats being unhealthy for some reason. People talk about eating clean, and they talk about getting rid of saturated fats, because apparently it's not eating clean. Now, in the 1950s, when a few men clutched their chests and dropped dead from heart attack, Ansel Keys wanted to know why. From the very beginning of his research, cholesterol has been at the forefront of discussion. And based on the previously mentioned clogged kitchen sink drain analogy, cholesterol was the hypothesis of keys as being the cause of heart disease and therefore fit the bill of the solution. Cholesterol is a vital component of the structure of cell membranes, the metabolism of sex hormones, and necessary for neural function. Just said that. Here I'm going again to the same thing. It has also been found to be an atherosclerotic plaque. Now, the understanding became that eventually enough cholesterol builds up in arteries, preventing blood flow and causes a heart attack. So therefore, researchers began to ignore cholesterol's vital function and focused on the misconception that it caused heart attacks. In reality, it's really only when LDL cholesterol oxidizes does it develop into atherosclerotic plaque. See, plaques really also only develop when there's injury, when there's insult to the blood vessel. Plaques start to form in order to repair and why is there injury in the first place? Sugar. 
There's a study known as the Boeing study, the same as the airline, it used 444 male employees with high cholesterol as their subjects. And half the employees consumed 18% of their total calories as fat, and the other half consumed 30%. At the completion of a year, there were significant differences. The lipid specialist named Robert Knapp, who was also a chief researcher of the study, noted a decrease in LDL cholesterol, the bad one, it would appear initially as positive, but Knapp also observed the men with the lowest fat diets and saw a decline in HDL, the good stuff, as well as significantly unhealthy rise in triglyceride levels, which is fat circulating in the blood. These results have been independently also been confirmed. Now, LDL cholesterol has been associated with obesity, high blood pressure, and a plethora of inflammatory conditions. On the other hand, HDL cholesterol is the opposite effect. HDL brings free cholesterol from the periphery, the walls of the artery, and transports it to liver for the use in the body. It can make all the good stuff. Now, HDL is not only good for us, but necessary for a healthy, functioning body. Now, in a follow-up to the famous and often referenced Framingham study, the investigators reported that in both men and women, ages 40 to 90, HDL had the largest impact of heart disease. If you had low HDL levels, which is under 35 milligrams per deciliter, you had eight times greater risk of heart attacks than those with higher HDL levels, 65 milligrams per deciliter or above. The study's authors wrote that the finding was the most important finding of all cholesterol data. It appears the evidence shows that while polyunsaturated fat reduces total serum cholesterol levels, it increases risk of heart disease, not because of lower DRUM or LDL levels, but partially from low HDL levels. HDL is necessary to function without incidence of disease. If saturated fats raise cholesterol levels, then what effect would a diet primarily consisting of this on heart disease be? It appeared in numerous trials, high fat, low carb diet lowers the risk for heart disease and diabetes. In over 15 controlled trials, a diet in high in fat, low in carbs raises HDL levels. It lowers triglyceride levels, lowers blood pressure, and reduces inflammation. And this type of diet also improves endothelial function, which is the ability of blood vessels to properly function and release nitrous oxide, another marker that's related to heart health. When endothelial cells stretch, as occurs during exercise, you release nitrous oxide. This causes atherosclerotic plaque to be absorbed back in the body and thus creates greater blood flow and greater oxygenation of body tissues. This is a good thing. Experiments where subjects consume 60% or greater calories from fat appear to show the most beneficial results to overcome obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. The kicker comes from the idea that sometimes answers we seek are right in front of our eyes. They can even be intertwined amongst other information. We simply need to know where to look. Now, to prove my thought and point, if not fat, carbohydrates, especially, like I keep saying, sugar, is far greater correlated with heart disease and saturated fat. We merely need to look at this study that shaped our present paradigm in American nutrition culture, which is the seven country study. So in 1999, there's a researcher named Alessandro Menadi, and he decided to go back and take a look at data from the 12,770 study subjects in the seven country study. He found that the category most related to coronary mortality was not saturated fat, as the study proposes. Instead, he found it was sweets, all sugar products. And sugar products had a correlation coefficient to the coronary mortality. I'll give you some numbers here, 0.821. In comparison, the animal food of saturated fat had a correlation coefficient of 0.798. Just so you know, a perfect correlation is 1.0. Therefore, what's closer to 1.0, 0.821 or 0.798? Now, the number may have been lower if margarine had not been included in the same category, but the study that shaped our nation's nutritional culture was looking at the incorrect statistics. As central obesity leads to heart disease, and the famous seven country study appears to be debunked by its chief researcher 25 years after the study was published. Oh yeah, Manati was the chief researcher, by the way. It appears that saturated fat does not lead to heart disease. Instead, the chief culprit has always been 
sugar. Well, let's talk about vegan here. Well, high carb, low carb, and in between. Now the idea of diets actually infuriates me, and that's why I'm writing the book that, well, no diet works. It's called a lifestyle. That's actually the name of the book. One month, diet X. It's going to be all the rave. And the following month, it's diet Y. Have you tried diet Y? Well, once you're done with that, Z is coming, right? Book publishers make money. They send out $2, and they come back with children. A lot of it. And diet books are big sellers. Authors get their 15 minutes of fame, and we find that instead of losing body weight, it's the weight of our wallets that gets lighter. So let me talk about some of the most popular diet trends of today. So between vegetarian and low-carbohydrate, more diets are a variation of these. So Dr. Ornish, the founder of the Ornish diet, made the vegetarian lifestyle famous. Now on the other end of the spectrum, it was Dr. Atkins who made eating low-carb all the rage. And a plethora of diets mimic these two and everywhere in between. It rests comfortably on your local bookshelf. That wasn't that nice. So low fat, high carb. Red meat, liver, butter, cream, and egg yolks gone. Those are high in fat, right? These foods are group five forbidden foods according to Dr. Dean Ornish, founder of the Ornish Diet. The Dr. Ornish advocates that in order to reverse heart disease, individuals must eat primarily fruits, vegetables, and grains. Three quarters of all calories must come from carbohydrates according to Ornish. And this principle allows people to be alert, whereas high-fat diets make people tired, depressed, lethargic, and impotent. Now, how can you be impotent if you're getting the good fats and cholesterol that help make sex hormones? Just curious about that one. Dr. Ornish's program involves aerobic exercise, yoga, and meditation. All lifestyles should involve aerobic, anaerobic, yoga, meditation. All good things. I mean, physical activity is part of your daily life is a positive thing. So that's not exactly a program that should just be, you know, your lifestyle. Just saying. As mentioned previously, physical exercises causes positive endothelial function, results in increased nitrous oxide release, and decrease in atherosclerotic plaque. It's a wonderful habit for all. It really is. Now, Dr. Ornish's phenomenal claims of his diet are based on a study from 1990 involving a whopping 22 subjects, again, being facetious. In this study, the subjects completed one year on this diet, including exercise, which, if we want to see if the diet works, we should remove exercise. Just saying. At this time, an angiography was completed where a widening of arteries was visualized in the subjects. The controls showed a narrowing of their arteries. These findings appear to be remarkable and received high acclaim. But there's only 22 people. The study size is way too small. And more concerning, they couldn't replicate the results. So it looks great on the surface, small sample size, can't do it again. Now, nutrition research journalist Nina Teichholz conducted an interview with Dr. Kay Gould, who is the co-author of Dr. Ornish's research papers. And Dr. Gould contests the reliability of angiographic evidence of artery widening. Now, Dr. Ornish also claims an amazing 300% improvement in blood flow in those who followed his regime. Unfortunately, his co-author, you know, if you're going to work with somebody, they should probably be on the same page. Dr. Gould contested that number, stating it was closer to 10 to 15%, not 300%. Dr. Ornish was contacted in regards to Dr. Gould's contraindication and responded, stating, Well, I'm not going to quibble about that. 10 to 15 percent, admittedly, is still something positive, and it is clinically significant. But we got to talk about honesty and ethics. 300 percent, if someone is claiming and it's not the case, what's up with that? In 1998, there was a scientific examination of the Ornish diet, completed by researchers looking at markers affected by the low-fat diet, where fat consisted of only 10 percent or less of total daily caloric intake. Both LDL and HDL were reduced. Triglyceride levels were observed as rising as high as 70% from baseline. Now, there's also concern that study subjects became fat soluble deficient, meaning AED and K deficient. The study's authors recommended this diet might be harmful for high-risk populations such as the elderly, pregnant, children, type 2 diabetics, 
and those with high triglycerides, and those with carbohydrate intolerance. Research goes as far even as linking low cholesterol levels to high rates of stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, and suicide, increased rates of cancer, and gallstones. Cholesterol, as I've said, is essential for sexual function. It's also essential for cerebral function. Our brain is fat. It's a big thing of fat. It needs fat to replenish itself. So you eliminate that, and you're going to start having some cerebral function, dysfunction. And if a vegetarian diet reduces level of cholesterol, then the risk for the terrible conditions and thus associated uh, with it are therefore elevated. And there's a lot to be said now. More and more research is coming out showing the benefits of cholesterol levels that are over 200. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, 500, 600. Let's be within reason here. But if you have cholesterol of 220, 240, it's not the end of the world. You start having cholesterol at 160, 170, you're going to start to have some reduction in vitality and longevity here. And this is proven. Take a statin, live less. Take a statin, live with more pain. This is fact. The research is showing this. It's well known that vegetarians are often anemic as they are unable to eat enough B vitamins, especially B12. And lack of B12 causes lack of intrinsic factor in the duodenum and the inability for iron to be absorbed. A variety of conditions also concur because of this. Now, I got to tell you, I want to believe in the diet. I really do. I mean, eating raw foods, exercising daily feels like it should be the answer to have, like, the ripped look. A positive outlook on life. A sharp is a knife mind. Life -loid avoidance of disease and unrelenting extreme virility. Love it. Yet the disturbing findings leave me to question if eating mostly fruits, vegetables, and grains is the answer to optimal human functioning. When I personally question whether the idea of heart disease reversal comes from the nutrition aspect of the Ornish program or the exercise aspect. Would the results, whatever the true results were, 10 to 15, 300, big difference, would they be the same if instead the subjects ate a diet high in fat? In regards to disease, a report in 2007 by the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research went on to say, in no case was the evidence for the consumption of fruits and vegetables and the prevention of cancer to be judged to be convincing. Obtaining water-soluble vitamins and minerals in fruits and vegetables, yes, this seems prudent, though the fat-soluble vitamins will still need to be eaten with fat for maximal absorption. Preventing heart disease and cancer from fruits and vegetables. The research speaks for itself, no. Let me go on the flip side here and talk low carb, high fat. A lot of people call it doing Atkins. Now, I'm keto, going keto. You, you cut slices from things, wrapped them in layers of fat, and laid row of meat on top, while the young men stood by, fire-pronged forks in their hands. That was written by Homer in the Iliad. Those who opt to eat a diet consisting of low-carb intake are often heard stating, you know, I'm doing Atkins, I'm on Atkins, and it was a fad, not by the company today known as Atkins, but by its founder, Dr. Robert Atkins. And Dr. Atkins was a cardiologist until met his unfortunate demise. No, he did not die of a heart attack, but we all do die of heart failure because our hearts cease to stop at some point. But he was leaving his office in New York City, and he slipped on the ice and struck his head on the concrete. Very sad. It really is. And previous to this, he published Dr. Atkins' Diet Revolution, causing an uproar to common nutritional thought. While the idea of low-carb, high-fat was seen to be egregious, truth be told, in terms of body fat loss, it straight up worked. In addition to weight loss, Dr. Atkins believed eating meat, eggs, cream, and cheese would fight heart disease, diabetes, and a plethora of other chronic diseases afflicting people across the globe. Now, by the time Dr. Atkins gained popularity, the low-fat paradigm was firmly ingrained into society, and Dr. Atkins was accused by his peers of being a guilty of malpractice and a nutritionist nightmare for his idea that consumption of high amounts of fat was healthy. But it worked! So, malpractice me call me a nutritionist nightmare but if your labs look better your body fat is down you look like a chiseled specimen you're performing better in life 
Who's the nutritionist nightmare? Not the guy that's getting you there, is it? Now, unfortunately, Dr. Atkins' theory, he counted on case studies to back him up as opposed to clinical trials. And simply because Dr. Atkins did not create an evidence basis for low-carb, high-fat does not mean one does not exist. There's a long history of diet lifestyle, and eating low-carb bohydrates dates back thousands of years. And a bit more recently, it was documented in the memoir called Strong Medicine by Dr. Blake Donaldson. He was introduced to the high-fat diet by experts of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. They educated him on the Inuit culture, who sustained life mostly disease-free by living almost entirely on the fattest meat they could kill. Now, Dr. Donaldson attempted to replicate this diet for his patients by removing all flour and sugar while eating fatty meat three times per day. He claimed that his 17,000 patients lost an average of two to three pounds per week without experiencing hunger pangs. Now, this may be due to the fact that fat leads to greater feelings of satiety than do carbohydrates, which avoid the risks of overeating. Learning from Dr. Donaldson, Dalford Alfred Pennington, an in-house physician for DuPont, applied this diet within the organization in an attempt to lower risk of heart disease in its middle-aged execs. Now, these executives consumed over 3,000 calories per day with a maximum of 80 carbohydrate calories at each meal three times a day. Pennington described the executives on this diet as experiencing a lack of hunger between meals, increased physical energy, and a sense of well-being. Now, these executives, despite eating a diet so high in calories, lost 7 pounds per month. Excuse me. They lost 7 to 10 pounds per month. And just think about that. Get these high-functioning guys eating way too many calories, and they're still losing weight, but it's coming in the form of fat calories. Big difference. It has a lot to do with the hormonal fluctuations. Again, though these are case studies, not controlled trials. And it is through true high-quality research we can fine-tune our understanding and hypothesis. The case studies by physicians such as Dr. Atkins, Dr. Donaldson, and Dr. Pennington are all very promising and pioneered the way for future research. It was actually Dr. Arist Westman at Duke University went through and was impressed with Dr. Atkins' patient files. Now he did a randomized controlled trial and went through with this. Dr. Westman and colleagues were among the first to provide scientific, solid scientific backing to the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. They found that when carbohydrates were replaced by fat, blood glucose and insulin levels normalize, patients must cease to use the medication, and the disease, in essence, goes into remission. More than 15 controlled trials since the year 2000, you got researcher Jeff Volick and colleagues determined a diet consisting of high-fat, low-carbohydrates, increased HDL levels, decreased triglycerides, decreased blood pressure, decreased inflammatory markers, and increased endothelial function. Bam. Heart disease, arthritis, and metabolic syndromes all share common traits such as low HDL, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, high levels of systemic inflammation, and low endothelial function. So you eat higher fat, lower carb, you get these results, and these results are directly correlated to heart disease, arthritis, metabolic syndromes. You can reverse them. The controlled trials by Volick and company appear to have merit in the realization of healthy human functioning. So when considering human performance, we often have an image of athletic performance in mind, right? Especially for endurance athletes. The idea of low-carb, excuse me, the idea of carb loading has been tested and so-called perfected. But even today, the idea of carb loading and performance peaking has not come to fruition. It's believed during training, a lower-carb, higher-fat diet can help train the body to use fat during exercise and recovery. Now, we've known this far back as 1983. And Volick and... Stephen Finney, who's a nutritional biochemist and physician, observed that athletes performed optimally on zero carbs. Yeah. By operating on ketone bodies derived free floating fatty acids, and carbohydrate loading becomes non existent, and our bodies can perform at a sustained higher level. 
So it is estimated Inuits live off of 70-80% of fat calories. They have an extremely low rate of disease. The Masi tribe in Africa exists on a diet of fatty meat, blood, and milk. They believe fruits and vegetables are only eaten by the cows. Hey, you want to eat fruits and vegetables? Eat a cow. Uh, the vegetarians of the world and Peter are going to love that one. Over 60% of their calories come from animal sources. Their blood pressure and weight were 50% lower than their low-fat eating American counterparts. A diet high in fat has been understood for decades now to be the optimal source of nutrition as our body was intended to live. Yet modern Americans appear ignorant of the fact and continue the downward spiral of health. It was Charles Darwin who discussed survival of the fittest. Perhaps survival of the sickest, as in the state of present-day Americans, should consider the findings of eating a high-fat diet. It appears from a psychological level of cellular function we need fat, and replacing it with an adequate fuel leads to disease. If a motor vehicle requires 93 octane gas, it's not going to function if you fill it with 87, is it? It's going to break down. The same goes for your body. Your body is a high-functioning machine. Fill it with the best fuel out there. Great innovator Steve Jobs once said, Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. Your body was designed to work in a particular manner. I have dispensed this podcast and show notes which are this podcast on our page at functionize.com under the podcast I've dispensed the information to a manner which works now this optimal human function is in your hands again what do you want to do with it do you want to live optimally or suboptimally you gonna make excuses or just live the life that you want to live it's your choice now you have the information. Can you shift your mental paradigm in which you live, or are you going to be stuck in a paradigm where disease is omnipresent? I keep referring to this in which Albert Einstein once stated he once defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again while expecting different results. Let me point it out to you. What is the result you desire? What is your goal? I would hope for all that peak human performance is at the top of everyone's list of goals. This spills over in a positive manner to all the other aspects in life. The decision is now yours. What are you going to do with it?